Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it. This late in the afternoon, just before the reception and the drinks and, and all that good stuff. After a long day of talking about eBPF, it's time to talk about actually putting it into production, which um, I love end user panels because I think everybody always can learn something from those. eBPF is a little bit different, I think, because most of you probably don't consume eBPF directly. Google does, maybe. Most of you probably don't, right? So it's kind of an interesting view of the ecosystem, I think, that's different from others. But uh, before we get started, I'm Frédéric Ladinois. I'm the enterprise editor at TechCrunch. And maybe the rest of you can just briefly introduce yourself, because I don't think we have a slide up with names. Yeah, hi, I'm James McShane. I'm the engineering director at Superorbital, a small uh, consulting firm. Hi, I'm Purvi Desai. I'm a director of engineering at uh, Google Cloud, focused on networking for Kubernetes. Hello, I'm uh, Daniel Bernier, a technical director at Valve, focusing on our telco transformation towards cloud native principles. Hi, I'm Andrew Sauber. I'm a staff software engineer at the New York Times, working on our cloud platform team. Awesome. And maybe to get started, a softball for all of you. How are you using eBPF at this point? And we'll just go down the line for this one, I think. Yeah, thank you. We're, we have a number of clients that work uh, directly with uh, Cilium specifically, but also have started to uh, extend that with uh, some of the observability capabilities as well. So we've been interfacing very closely with uh, that from a network security standpoint, and then uh, extending that into the observability realm over the last, uh, last year. I think uh, I have to answer this question from two perspectives. <laughs> okay. One is uh, representing the Google hat. From Google perspective, we have various groups using eBPF uh, in a wide range of applications. It starts from networking, compute, security, um, telemetry, of course, which is like the key. Uh, and we have been at it now since years. So I would say we are also, we have been installing eBPF programs now uh, almost in millions of machines. And almost all Google traffic, I would say, touches or is touched by eBPF program, one form or the other. So that is the one part of Google. And um, actually, if you see even the eBPF core coming, uh, contributors, we have a lot of, uh, at least 25% of the folks. And then similarly, from the uh, steering committee, we participate in the steering committee too. Now the second angle, which is more of a Kubernetes engine, or GKE, and Anthos, and GDC, there uh, we started the journey of using eBPF-based uh, data plane around in 2019. Uh, it's not even 2019, 20, early 2019. And when, then we it looked at all the ecosystem. We picked Cilium, because Cilium was a, a vibrant ecosystem with a lot of the um, uh, feature sets that we needed, and also on top of it, something that we can contribute to. So we have taken that into our uh, main um, uh, products, GKE, Anthos, GDC, GDC uh, Edge, and all. And it is in production uh, for all of them. So in today's date, uh, the GKE fleet is rapidly moving to this new data plane, and all the others are already on this data plane. So. Daniel, how many million cores of eBPF are you? <laughs> Divided by X, uh, <laughs> so uh, no, we don't have the same. So you have two trends into eBPF. We are uh, consumers of Cilium and the full suit of observability of all we started now with Tetragon and everything uh, as a consumer. We also have as a consumer the data plane v2 from the Google environments when we use Google's uh, version of Kubernetes. And uh, from that's more like production oriented. We also have our development phase around, uh, because we have a, we do some P4 coding, so we're also looking at programmable data plane using the LEAF effort that came out of Walmart around the uh, SDK for EPF. So we have that, which is more exploratory to get ourselves uh, in the foot. Got it. Yeah, so um, I joined the Times just over a year ago, and um, I was asked to help lead the team to build kind of the next generation Kubernetes platform. Um, when I joined, um, I can't give exact numbers, but there are many, many, many clusters, Kubernetes clusters in use at the times. And they kind of all had their 
network policies um, kind of delegated to the cloud provider on which they were running um, because there wasn't much strong isolation that was needed within those clusters. Now we want to do this huge multi-tenancy um, thing, which we are doing, and um, a lot of production traffic is already flowing through it, and we needed fast network policies, and Cilium's just the obvious choice if you want fast network policies. Nothing like re-architecting your whole architecture, so uh, people can play Wordle and um, be the oh, I mean, <laughs> yes, people can play Wordle. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of you are using Cilium, obviously, right? Um, can you talk a little bit why you're using, why you made that choice, and you know, because there's other options, obviously. Yeah, definitely. We went through an evaluation process for uh, the the main product we were working on through our firm was. Um, a product that allowed for a real dynamic set of uh, executions. It was within a financial services firm. And so when you're allowing like data from a number of different sources to flow through your production system, you really need to be able to understand kind of everything about the, the network path and the network execution, right? Where are you reaching out to? How large of, is the data that's coming into the system? And how large is the data going out of the system? And then get that extra context from the Kubernetes API. And so we needed the L7 filtering that Cilium provided, and then they, they made it really easy to pull in the context that was around that enable, and enable the appropriate level of um, experimentation that the product, product required while still locking it down from a security perspective. So we started from the network security uh, you know, uh, field in terms of evaluating the product, and then what EBBF allowed us to do was extend that into the um, you know, execution level environment. We've heard all about the capabilities of you know, EBPF filtering and things like that today. And so that was, you know, we started in the network security path and then went into kind of host security and uh, gathering those, that information we needed to make decisions about whether users should be allowed to do things. How much of that, and maybe some of you can answer the same question, but how much of that, because it's still early days for eBPF, right? How much of that felt like an early bet on a technology? Um, we, had some, we had some hiccups along the way, but they were, uh, it was more about some of the complexities around the, the layer seven filtering implementation within Cilium, which ends up delegating to Envoy on the host. The eBPF portion of that has been uh, rock solid in terms of our use case of it, and you know, in terms of the amount of data that we're piping through the, the platform, it's, uh, the performance has been spectacular. Maybe I can come in. Uh, in the world of Kubernetes, almost everything is new technology, so <laughs> I, it, it's not a real big scare. I've lived OPNAV with OVS and all those things, so I, I have some scars of this. OpenStack. Uh, yeah, I know, yeah, but the networking part was ugly. Um, I think the fact that we, when we looked at this from a technology perspective, it's the, I would say the backing. So uh, early on when I started to work on the networking side of, of the clusters and the communities, uh, I was a really big fan. I'm still a fan of, for example, v vector packet processing, VPP. But if we think eBPF is kind of heteroclet, uh, surreal, the eBPP coding is even worse. So you realize that there's only a few handful of people who actually know how to code this. While eBPF, everybody is actually involved. It's in the kernel. It's, it's already part of that mainstream. So kind of... It might, there might be some paradigm shift, and there is, there are paradigm shifts to this, but uh, uh, you feel a bit more secure than, and that was one of the drivers where, where it's actually uh, pushed us towards that technology. Pervy? Yeah, I think uh, your question was, uh, why Cilium? And uh, let me answer this question also a bit, very interestingly, because I think Daniel covered this very important topic about VPP and other data planes. So and when we had to really look into newer data planes, and we needed new data plane because we need flexibility, we need feature velocity, we need composability, and we need a lot of strength uh, from the data plane where we can program at ease. So we did evaluate multiple sets of data plane, and imagine we are in Google, so we have a lot of uh, technologies within Google, uh, starting from our USPS or starting, uh, now you can actually, when VPP, we had actually looked into. So overall, uh, when we evaluated all of this, one thing was very clear for us that we needed to do, we needed to have EBPF. The reason why is also very interesting because we wanted to be close to applications. 
it is important to have that application context be available. That was one. Second, the ease of programming. Daniel just mentioned it. It is, it is super easy at this point of time uh, to build on top of it. Now the question was, uh, why CDM? And for us, again, there, the answer was rather straightforward when it started off. So there was an option of either we build something inside internally, or we adopt a open source project, which was active, doing very well. Uh, so from that perspective, when we looked at the landscape, it was Cilium. We have been interacting with the Cilium community uh, from Kubernetes angle too. So it made more sense uh, for us to adopt a project which we could contribute to, which we could use, and, uh, and that is how we ended up uh, with Cilium ecosystem. Let me ask there, since you brought it up, if Google had built its own version, how would it have been different? Like, what would you have done? We have a name too, by the way, <laughs> which we'll <laughs> not talk about it right now. We have a code name. <laughs> We're well, still so, working on it. Is that what you're saying? So, so the way it is is that um, right now we have decided that Cilium works for us. So we are working with Cilium community, uh, Thomas and others on modular modularization of Cilium. The main thing is our customers want, our users want power of end, as we call it where they want to use open source function or they want to use enterprise functions of vice versa, and they also want to use all the goodness that Google is bringing. So when we have to do this, uh, there is a need for building that modular architecture. So we're working with uh, uh, Cilium on this uh, very actively to make Cilium act more like a platform on which we can bring multiple uh, network functions on it. Uh, at this point, I think this is what our North Star is. North Star is to have the dynamic marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, open ecosystem, and we believe we can achieve with this. So, Fair enough, I had to ask that. Um, Andrew, you, you've been looking skeptical at times over there. Oh, no, I'm just thinking about my answer to that question. So earlier I said Cilium is the obvious choice if you want fast network policies, but obviously um, there are other ways to do network policies, even with BPF in Kubernetes. Um, I think the reason that we went with Cilium um, was more so around kind of the community and the uh, uh, kind of like the pedigree of the um, team working on Cilium. In the past, we've gotten on Slack and asked for features that appeared a few months later uh, with a full test suite, and it's, um, yeah, it's just been great so far. Yeah, I guess I, I wanted to, to second that point is that the uh, the community around the Cilium project is is really strong, and we've enjoyed you know we've uh, gone in the Slack and then contributed pull requests and issues as uh, as we were diagnosing you know we we had an issue that we ran into with uh, some large scale processing that was going through um, the L7 proxy and out to um, out to the public internet from one of the clusters we were working on, and. You know, diagnosing together with the team through through over Slack, as well as you know, putting putting that information into um, out into GitHub, and it turned out there were a couple other folks that were experiencing the same problem, and we're able to to narrow it down. And that that kind of uh, uh, collaborative approach, when we've got you know, especially in an enterprise environment where you you know you, you have to be careful about what data you're able to share and things like that, but we were, we were really able to work well with that team and uh, felt confident in the community as we built our product on top of it. So what's, uh, what's your sense of the community right now anyway? Because the community is so important to a project like this, right? Um, Dan, you want to, what, what's kind of your sense? Because you've been here all day, as far as I yeah, can. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I do like the community a lot. I, I think uh, there's leadership in the vision of what eBPF does. It's actually not, it's actually rare that you're able to see like the, the group that maintain the kernel pieces of it be everywhere if, uh, uh, reachable every day, actually. Uh, Any time uh, out of day you select them, they're going to answer, you have a question. The breadth of the skill set we've seen from the, the, the group, uh, John Festeban that was speaking this morning, was the guy doing LLVM and P4 at Intel before. So you think about, hey, I want to do eBPF offload. He has this brains already hooked on this. So it's really strong. And plus, the user community is also quite impressive. It's rare that you will see all hyperscalers involved in the same technology and adopting the same technology. Normally, you end up kind of, it's, it's, a, 
it's a, a fight that you have to f f deal with now and no it's all agreed upon so that's actually quite interesting for us it solves some of our issues around finding the right platform that can run everywhere it kind of getting there to that level so that's interesting to us yeah. One point that I want to build on that was that as a part of the community, it does seem like there's a great understanding from the the maintainers who are working at the kernel level and the you know the real nitty gritty of the eBPF code that end users you know don't experience. But there is um, they have a, a good understanding of where that ends up when it comes to the user's hands, right? Uh, I think John, when he he was talking this morning about um, all the context that end users want to see. When, when stuff comes out of the kernel, right? You don't want to see, you know, I know numbers, and you don't want to see, you know, network network namespace IDs. You want to see the Kubernetes data, right? And and bubble that up, and potentially even get data about, you know, cluster and you know the even higher level data that can be gathered. So that because when you're trying to operationalize products in this space, uh, like Andrew said, right? You're not working with a single Kubernetes cluster. I mean, that's, that's not how anyone deploys these days, right? There's hundreds of clusters, potentially thousands of clusters, each with their own set of nodes. So you, you need that context to be able to, you know, make an actionable decision from, you know, maybe a, an event that happens on a node that has to bubble up across, you know, pod, namespace, node, cluster, a region, you know, all the way up in that level. Andrew, you've been talking about having all those clusters to deal with. Is that the problem you're seeing as well? Um, so, <laughs> we've kind of sidestepped that problem for the moment. We don't have things like Cilium Mesh set up um, between some of what we might call a legacy cluster. You sidestepped it by not dealing with it? Is it? Um, yeah, the, the meshing integration routing to those systems is um, uh, currently in development. Um, what we do have is a um, multi-VPC setup in one of our clouds right now, um, which is where a lot of the Cilium network policy has come into play. And um, there was something we said earlier that sparked something, and now it's, it's slipping my mind. I'm sure we'll get back to it. But yeah. Sounds good. Now, as you're putting all Cilium and everything else into production, how much of that, how much are you relying on your own in-house experience and how much are you outsourcing to, to vendors at this point? Because uh, you just mentioned a couple of issues where I was like, that's kind of a problem for the vendor maybe more than the community, but kind of uh, wh what's the state of, of play there for you right now? It depends. Uh, I would say it depends. It depends on the, how ugly your applications are. <laughs> if you end up with in-house grown applications that have, like I have July move systems that came out with a VAX VMX system still. So it's not something that you can easily port into an application, into a Kubernetes cluster when you try to migrate. So there are some hooks to do. Uh, and this is where you like to have more hand holding from the, actually the Cilium guys around. Is there a hook you can do in eBPF to try and make it work? And actually that happens. Something I could not do if I was mainstream, any kind of other technology, or even the major vendors, which I normally rely on, I end up with it's a roadmap, we'll have it in three, four years, maybe two years, because you're the first customer that asks it and the volume is not that big. That's the end story. On eBPF, you don't have that issue anymore. It's kind of, it gets, gets fixed. Uh, so for those kind of things, we need, we're, we're more involved because we know our applications, which are sometimes uh, really custom. For other mainstreams, we actually leverage, we try to leverage as much as possible the ecosystem. So if, it's, if it's been solved somewhere else, why do we need to reinvent the wheel? Although I just did a talk about reinventing the wheel of networking, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Do what I say, not what I do. That's a, uh, James, go Well, on. yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, a, a good consultant answer is, is, is it depends. And I, I would uh, second Daniel there and, and say that I, I would, you know, the, the large percentage of enterprise customers that we see, you know, their, their application integrations are not that deep. But um, when you get to people that are working in more unique environments, we have a, a customer that has, uh, you know, devices deployed onto, onto drones and things like that. Those are the people that, that have a more deep need, you know, when, when you have like unique hardware, or unique network requirements, right? That's where the hooks and the, the capabilities that eBPF provides to just to modify your execution environment without 
needing, you know, you know, from, from the outside, right? You, you can really reason about things nicely. And I guess I've, I've drifted away from the question a bit, but I think the community is strong, the vendor ecosystem is strong, and there's, I, I think there's a fairly obvious line when you, when you start to go down into the implementation of when, you know, when is this a vendor problem? It, you know, there's, there's a strength of the community, you start there, and then you build on, you know, build what you need. Well, let's uh, start with the community, um, the annual airing of grievances. Like, what, what do you need from the community right now? What, what are you looking for from the community? All right, so I think for us, first of all, the community is all of us. So that is the key thing. Um, now, even there, there is a nuanced answer. So when we talk about EBPF, uh, generally, the com the, what we need basically is an ability for us to really have better controls on who can install EBPF programs, what kind of programs can we install. Uh, in, in a way, we are almost looking at a EBPF program registry, right? Who's owning it? Can they really install those hooks? Uh, if, uh, and what hall have they installed? All of it. So that is one part of it, which is largely from the EBPF community. And as I said, it's really made, we, that, that is a need for us from throughout Google as well as my own products. Then comes the uh, second piece of it, which is we as a provider of the Kubernetes engine and data plane for that. Over there, uh, the biggest thing that we need is an ability for us to compose multiple, like putting together multiple uh, technologies for our users. Uh, and at the same time, we need to be sure that we are, uh, it's well tested, it's, it's hardened, it's better tested, because when we are supporting, let's say, 15,000 nodes cluster and all of that, it really needs to scale. So we can't just have this, that bring whatever you want on top of this and then, uh, you know, it's hard, tough luck. Mm -hmm. So we, we basically walk a line where we bring an opinionated solution and when it comes to, let's say, Kubernetes uh, data plane, which GKE, Anthos, GTC, and there, uh, at the same time, we also want to enable customers to have the flexibility. So from the community there, we need an ability to really bring all of this together, making it modular, making data plane modular, being, making it composable, and it, it should all work together. So uh, one, of, one of the things that I see when users really look into this problem is they all need, in, in some ways, to solve the business problem. Data plane is a means to an end. And con that, that all that business logic of the control plane is also a means to an end. But they need to express that um, control plane. And the idea is if you're able to express it in a manner which is consistently executed, no matter what data plane is running, that is what we need. And uh, in a way, that is what we are uh, marching towards. It sounds like one of those classic enterprise moments in a startup's lifetime where, oh, we, now we need enterprise controls. And, and It yeah. always is, right? <laughs> There's always this, uh, you know, it is a real demand from our customers, right? That mm. I need to solve this problem with this. And uh, we need to make sure that it's a safe way of introducing it in the product which is going to be used by everybody. Sure. So sure. that is that red line. Um, one challenge I see at the moment with the community, not really the community, I think, the overall ecosystem of EP, EBPF, it's kind of a trendy term right now. So like if you think about something, it needs to be AI ML or it needs to be EBPF. So um, the trick is that uh, EBPF is not locked to Cilium. Anybody can build platforms based on EBPF technologies. So you end up having, I would like kind of, a, in my, my, my utopian world would be, if I had a version, it probably Cilium could be, of the Sonic Sci version of things, like a common data plane that most people can use, so that I end up with having, I do an RFP, I have 25 versions of an eBPF data plane that almost sometimes do the same thing, but not just enough to make it different. That, that's where I'd say there's commonality that could be gained out of this, that maybe probably the 80%, 80-20 rule fits one data plane model existing for everybody, pick this one. If you want to come at it, customize, then it's when the, what Pervy said about the modularity can come in, but not reinventing every time. That, that's right now my scare around that ecosystem. So it's a trendy thing. Everybody will want to build their own version, and at the end, I'm going to end up with 25 versions of a data plane using Cilium. 
uh, APPF. So. Yeah, one of the things that I took away from the day today was there are a lot of really powerful tools operating at the you know language protocol level, right? We we heard about gRPC, HTTP one, um, TLS interception, right? And each one of those had its matrix of things that it could do and operate. But that's not the way that we think about it from an application perspective, right? Your your application has to talk to you know your database, your other services. And the protocols aren't, you know, for that communication aren't generally dictated by you saying I want to instrument my application with, you know, with doing, you know, this gRPC support because I've got this great library that's going to allow me to observe it, right? And so, what I what I'd really love to see is an ability to well, and, and from that last talk we just saw virtually, right? There are a ton of really excellent tools for data collection when you get, you know, on the node within the context that you're having an issue, but I need to think more from an application perspective of like, you know, I, I've got all of this data that I need to gather about how this thing is communicating and making sure that it's, you know, ensuring it's successful and ensuring appropriate operations. Um, and how can I take all these powerful individual tools and wrap those together to make it something that I can, you know, I can act on from, uh, from my application development perspective? Andrew? Yeah. Um, so there's two things that I think we need from the community at the moment and would help to contribute um, to the community. And I have an anecdote attached to one of them. So I really enjoyed uh, Tomas's talk earlier from Tigera um, about debugging eBPF. Because um, in, the, in the past, you know, I've worked on teams where we got used to staring at the massive IP tables dump from the CNI and like do the jumps in our head, okay, this service should be routing to here. And um, it was a little bit more understandable in that regard if you had experience doing that type of thing. Um, and if you look at the Cilium repo, and especially in the XDP program itself, you see that they're adding verdicts, adding reasons that packets were dropped and associating them with the network filters. Like, it's a very active area of development in Cilium. Um, and this, the story that I have to go along with this is we were experiencing kind of like the worst kind of uh, Heisen bug where pods would just randomly stop um, being able to deliver traffic. And we were on um, EKS. And what we were able to do at the time was actually dump the BTFs and do what you described that like you wouldn't necessarily expect a user of Cilium to do. And at that point, we were staring at this bytecode and we were just like, um, well, we know that it's the same bytecode for this pod and that pod, and this pod's working and that pod's not working, so um, it must not be BPF. And it turns out that there was a race condition in the ENI allocator in Cilium that had already been fixed by Datadog. Shout out to the engineer at Datadog that fixed that problem. Um, but it was kind of like a wild west in terms of debugging. And it kind of relates to this observability question of um, how can we tie what we used to think of as a socket with an IP address, I mean, well, whatever, NF tables type um, debugging to this new world of you have these TC hooks that can just redirect flows to other interfaces and, and that type of thing. And I think we're seeing the tooling be developed, so it's, it's really cool. And that bug is fixed, so that's... Yes, <laughs> oh, we deployed the new version of Cilium and we, we haven't seen the issue since then, so. I want, to, uh, I want to just kind of Mike. add something to this. In terms of observability, I feel that um, let's say whichever ecosystem you're running in, the Kubernetes cluster even, either it's bare metal or on a cloud provider. In cloud providers, they bring their own SDN layer under the hood. I think there is a need to connect uh, all the context. Right now, it seems like the context of each of the like uh, observation point, uh, first of all, they are not consistent. And even if the context is consistent, it is, it is unclear at this point of time if uh, our users are able to even connect it together in, in, in a proper logical manner to say, okay, 
maybe not the pod, maybe it's the, maybe it's the uh, node, maybe it's not the node, maybe it's the interconnect, maybe it's not this, maybe something else. And I think the whole observability space is something that I feel really needs to kind of come together in a way where uh, there is a context mm -hmm. which is understood by the application uh, developers or platform owners or ad network admins or security admins, a way where they can all make sense of the same data in a different manner with the same context. Uh, that that is a, actually a big challenge, and I don't, I'm not necessarily considered that to be a BPF problem, or it's it's not that. It's I think eBPF helps in a way to observe all this. That's great, uh, that you can get the application context along with the network, which was which was really uh, not possible if you were not running close to application. But then after that, there are other layers too. So somehow, if you are able to kind of put together a context. Uh, and that is where I think at least all people are even trying to solve this problem for the end, our own end users. Yeah, I think that's a, you bring up a great point about the fact that, you know, this, these kind of, this kind of tooling is awesome at the Kubernetes node level um, when, you're, when you're that close, but then there's these other contexts that get layered on top no matter, you know, especially in the cloud providers, right, where they, they've got their, uh, their network layer on top of that including their own network security, that then you get to, um, you, you lose the portability that, you, that you're experiencing with Cilium at the Kubernetes layer, then you still have things, you know, we, we're working on a product that was getting replicated into each one of the major cloud providers, and it's like, yeah, Cilium was great when we were talking about, you know, isolation on the, you know, the pod executions, but when we, when we got out of that and we got up to the cloud providers, you know, it's, there's just not a common language, right? And, and you don't have, um, you know, I'd love to see something like Cilium identities that are so powerful inside of a cluster. And this is potentially where, you know, like a multi-cluster mesh and things like that could be helpful as well. But that is where I think what we have taken approach is uh, making it Kubernetes-centric. So as long as I think it is uh, Kubernetes first, developer first. We like the developer first model of Kubernetes. So when it comes to uh, that model, if you're able to annotate, for example, things that are being generated, the, the telemetry and other things that are being generated from the other uh, instances in cloud, if we have the similar Kubernetes con context to it, at least it solves the Kubernetes problems. That is where we are aligning towards. Andrew, you looked like you had a eureka moment. Oh, uh, not so much a eureka moment, but um, actually, I did have a eureka moment. Um, so, in terms of looking at things from the pod level, then the node level, and uh, the interconnect level, um, we were looking at Hubble, and we could tell that if the pod was on the same node as the uh, what appeared to be a broken pod, because the issue was that um, the the IP associated with the pod uh, would be dropped at layer two on the Amazon side, but if the pod's on the same node, then Cilium is just going to route the traffic, and it's going to, it's going to, um, you know, the the flow is going to work. Um, and it was kind of like we actually had that level of insight where we could look at the node, and um, luckily we're all within the same cluster, so these things had um, like consistent identities within the cluster. Um, and so what was my point? It, my point is, like, we saw, like, earlier today, we, we saw that the next version of Hubble is going to have Grafana-style metrics integrated into it, which is awesome. Um, sometimes you look at Hubble, um, you show someone Hubble for the first time, and they don't realize how powerful it actually is that you're seeing the flows at a pod level annotated with these identities. And I think that's going to help take things a little bit to the next level where you're going to be able to correlate um, met uh, yeah, metric type events between your systems, at least perhaps visually. So. You're going to see on how much trouble I am <laughs> from observability. Me, I have to think about Kubernetes observability with ABPF. And I have to think about a 5G core with NWDAF from 3GPP that doesn't care about any of this. They have their own model. I end up with a residential gateway that does TV streaming with TR369, a USP model, which is yet another not observability model that fits. So 
anything that actually gets to the application level, I'm happy because it's the one thing I don't have to care about anymore. It's fixed. I've got Hubble, I've got uh, Tetragon, I've got open telemetry, I can Jaeger trace the thing, I can see everything. My trouble is really when these things need to get integrated with the rest. I, now my, I, my stress factor goes quite up because I have way more work there than in the cloud piece. So uh, for me, that, that's, not, that's not a real issue as, as of yet. When I, my issue is when you look at all that ecosystem of, uh, and out and I, I need to have a correlation around why did my TV streaming app on a home that failed because a cluster a pod inside some kind of centralized cloud broke. This is where my end-to-end -end observability needs to be more standardized. That's my some of my challenges. All right, I think our time is pretty much up here. Thank you very much for, for being here. And we'll do it again next year, and we'll see what we talk about then. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.